Okay, so uh, we're officially recording, so good to cool. have you over, sir. Thanks, Jeff, man. Dr. Jeff Woods in the house. You're probably the most talked about person on the podcast. <laughs> There's so many people that have been on, have, like, have we've had conversations about you. Well, we, we have a lot of history, too, so, you yes. know, there's, yeah. We've Indeed. been friends for a while. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, just people bring up, uh, like, I'm like, bread and these guys that only know you uh, in, yeah. a, in a jiu-jitsu capacity, too, yeah. as well. Actually, I had bread in class before. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember taking, uh, I just mentioned this class earlier, uh, Jeffersonian and Jacksonian Democracy. That's what I'm starting right now. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, like that little section of U.S. History 1. Yeah. And uh, when I was taking that class in the summer, I was sitting in on it with Dr. Gleason and Brad was in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I, that's how I met him too. Was it is the, at the history department. I just, just re remembered that. I mean, yeah. It's, it's amazing how many people sort of come through there and you know, it's, it's like Arkansas in general, Russellville's a small place. You're going to run across somebody, you know, or somebody who knows who, you know, all the time. I know, like going out, um, anywhere. Yeah. I can I, I see so many people cause Cora and I just, we, we we encountered so many people through the gym and then I'm running to people all the time that I had classes with went to school with that have stuck around yeah. from here and it's yeah yeah I, I travel around all over the state now because of the governor school stuff yeah well, yeah and uh, it it never ceases to amaze me I spent most of my life in Arkansas but I can go anywhere in the state and it takes about five minutes and we'll find a connection of somebody that we know or somebody we have in common uh, yeah you know everybody talks about arkansas as being kind of a small town and man it really is yeah yeah um so i'm teaching arkansas history this uh, i think i told you this i've been yeah. been talking to dr de black i'm yeah. trying to get him ironed out uh, to maybe come in and be a guest speaker he said he would oh yeah uh, we're, we're getting close to the civil war i was trying to get him to come and do the big bear of arkansas <laughs> Just because he has a traveling production <laughs> that he likes to roll out. Did he sing in class for you guys too? He sang, man. He did. Like Cora told me, she's like, we didn't have to read True Grit when I took him, and I was like, what? Because we were watching the new True, the newest True Grit that came yeah, out. I, uh, I don't have the guts to sing in class, man. That's another thing. <laughs> oh man, that dude's got no. He's he's the least self conscious person I've ever met. I think he's a character. Oh yeah. I really, uh, I really enjoyed, and it was awesome getting this. I saw him in the city mall, yeah, like a few weeks ago, and I just like he was looking at me, and he kept looking over at me, and I don't know if he didn't recognize me with my hair or whatever. And he got up, and I, I went over, I was like, Doctor Black, it's good to see you, and he's just like, Oh, Brian, and I was just like, I'm teaching Arkansas history, man. <laughs> I'm so excited. I've been talking to Derek all the time, yeah, because uh, Derek Rowley's been helping. Yeah, me. Derek's a good resource. Yeah, man. yeah, I miss I, Derek. Me too, man. I, I hope um, he's talking about maybe moving back. That's what I hear. Have you talked to him recently? Uh, no, but, uh, you know, Michael in the office, good friends with Derek. Okay, yeah. And so uh, I hear from Michael every once in a while about what's going on with Derek. So, And I, I try to see him uh, when he's in town. He'll yeah. come through every once in a while yeah. and we'll get to sit down and talk. But, yeah, I miss the dude. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, too. I was, like, right out here on 7 coming – coming home from the gym or somewhere i saw scott tomlin yeah yeah i haven't seen scott in forever and i like yeah. rolled down my window i was like i'm teaching arkansas history man like same scenario with, but it's like i was in arkansas history with scott and Derek yeah. at the same time yeah, they man. were in they were in grad school yeah and uh i just i just remember it being a great time it was one of my favorite classes I ever yeah took. yeah i love scott too i mean all those guys I, what's scott doing uh, he works in uh, the advising office okay. at Tech. Okay, and he's really good at it. He's yeah. really good at it. I can't. I can't remember his last name. I was trying to think of it the other day. A guy named Will. He was a history major. He worked in the advising center for years. Uh, he had a JFK paper the day JFK was assassinated on his wall. But that guy helped me. You're talking about Will Cooper? Yes. That yeah, guy yeah. helped me Will so much. Okay. Too. That guy, I mean, made a difference because. I didn't declare, um, like I came back when I was 23 and 09 and I still didn't declare a degree for a minute. I was yeah. just taking class I wanted to take. Yeah, and right. I talked to that guy so many times from the time I started college until I like got a, a formal advisor. Yeah. And even after I had, I could just go talk to him and he would just give me yeah. sound advice. Yeah. 
no nah, he's 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 a good dude too you know there's so many <laughs> there's so many great people that have come through that that department that that's offense. a that's a and you need i think you need that yeah i i just now like well, i was trying to remember him the other day because i'm doing advising yeah so yeah. uh and i have a, like uh, 30 advisees this semester i had like a dozen last semester as yeah. i like, doubled it um but it's interesting it's something uh, i never it, it it makes it it's something that's been introduced it's made me re-remember some things and think about my role yeah. a little differently advising gets to be really important too i mean it, it, it's uh you know i know we get people in classes and do that kind of stuff but real advising is is more about giving people kind of life advice and uh that can be really fun and interesting and rewarding yeah uh, a lot of people will remember uh the advising stuff than they will the you know teaching in classroom stuff uh, yeah because you know sometimes every once in a while you'll get something that's really heavy or deep or you find out what's going on with somebody and what's keeping them from doing well and it's usually you know it's life stuff it's not it's very rarely sort of pure academic kind of things yeah it's something you know with their kids or their family or money situation or something like that and uh i've really i've really sort of enjoyed that part of the job do you ever like i mean is that something you ever inquire into? Like when you, you, you see a student, I, I tell this uh, to Dr. Black again. Yeah. Uh, one time I bombed like the second test or the yeah. first test and like Derek and Scott told me not to read one of the chapters and <laughs> Native Americans they didn't think was going to be on there very Never much. Never listen to somebody who says don't read something. <laughs> and they're like, did Jeannie Wayne chapters are not good? Don't read them. And I was like, all right, guys, you guys are in graduate school. I'm, I don't know even what I'm doing yet. But I remember I made like a 68 on the exam. I had a similar thing, I think, in like your espionage class. Oh, really? But uh, to where like I just like on the front end of the class, like it was like the first time I'd had you. Was first, uh, that's the only time I had Dr. DeBlay. You're figuring out how the professor exactly. does their processes. Yeah, yeah. He and you actually have a very similar approach very on, similar. Well, on we assessment. Had, yeah, we had, uh, we had the same mentors. So yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, <clears throat> I, what was I don't even remember where we were going with that. I <laughs> got got to thinking about it. Uh, we could see we always called uh, Doctor Dubai Papa Bear too. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> no. Every, everybody had a code name yeah. amongst the student workers. Yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? <laughs> it happens all the time. I know. I've been uh, man like we've been dealing with Pupper Man's foot like at night and first thing in the morning, having to bandage him up because he'll just like pr he'll peel that sock off and he walks around, and gets blood all over everything. Yeah, so that's been a uh, yeah. My dog has a cone on his head right now. A cone? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh like you know, that the thing that keeps. I was saying like, like Dan Aykroyd. No, <laughs> reverse Dan Aykroyd, right? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, it keeps them from, like, uh, she had surgery on her lip and uh, she had like cancer. Oh man. And so they had to just cut out a little part. It was, it was easy. It was fine. No big deal. But she's got to wear the cone so she doesn't like paw at it and rip the stitches out. Yeah. And dogs look so pitiful when I they know, have that cone man. on. <laughs> I feel so well, bad We had to for put him. Mrs. Kitty, uh, our eldest Siamese cat, in yeah. a cone one time and it was, it was rough. The cats apparently... Uh, the vet was talking about this you know dogs will just kind of get depressed and cats will get pissed off and start peeing on your stuff and doing that kind of man thing. mrs kitty this is no lie mrs kitty takes cats in x because <laughs> she was doing that dude yeah. for 15 days in a row she peed on my stuff like i was just like we can't have anything nice oh my god <laughs> like we just bought new mattress new furniture all the stuff yeah. and i and like we just took her to the vet oh she might like spent hundreds of dollars at the vet and there's nothing oh she might have an infection but it's like no she just hates us and now she takes a pill every day and has not peed on anything in months see that's the thing for me with like cat and dog people i mean i'm not a cat person mainly because of allergies it's not that i don't like cats it's just that you know i can't be around them that much yeah but, um but you know if you're a dog person it's like you're getting love from the dog all the time no matter what completely social animal always there for you you know the best friend thing is absolutely true 
and cats, it's always like this tense relationship. There's always something going on with the cat. You want their affection. It was so funny. It's like, Miss Kitty's like six years old. In her whole life, we just wanted her to be like the cat that's at your friend's house. Yeah. You go over and they're, they're loving on you and you're like, I wish my cat. Yeah. And she's just like, the only time is be like, you'll have this laptop on your lap. And then she's like, hey, I want to sit on your lap. The only time she would ever have anything to do with this. And now that she's taking the pills, she just like the most affectionate, loving, purring cat wants to be <laughs> around you all the time. Follows me around in the morning while I'm getting ready to go to the university. Maybe that's the key for dog people having cats. You just got to get them on drugs. Part of part of it was we moved. She'd only lived in the apartment for like five years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a big deal d- then animals. we got a dog. Yeah. Then we got another dog. Yeah. Yeah, you screwed with her world pretty yeah, bad. Yeah, I mean, she, she like our apartment didn't have ceiling fans. So, like, the whole first three months of her life, she's like... <laughs> what is it, the ceiling there? fan, like it's out to get her? Oh, man. Yeah. Like, just this existence at the top of the room. Because, yeah. like, we just had, like, a normal fixture or whatever. She's like, what is it? Our one in there had the big leaf-looking things on it. So, yeah. anyway. So, what we were talking about a second ago, Dr. Black making an impact through some academic advising, called yeah. me into his office and was like what are you doing here? Yeah. And was kind of stern, but then was like, Hey man, I just really care about your progress in my class. And yeah. I, I, you know, I wanted to be sure what's going on. And I just told him, I'm like, man, I, I just miffed at studying and yeah. just, yeah, I've, you know, building the gym and I work here and I got stuff yeah. going on and I don't really have a great excuse. First time I've had you in class and I'm sorry, and I'm going to make it better. Yeah. And, but him calling me in and kind of just like, Hey, what's going on here? Yeah. And the, the, the tough love like as a as a as a professor as a teacher is something you got to get kind of used to um but in the end i mean it's like you'll see when you have kids it's like when you have kids your greatest actions of affection for people can sometimes be the ones where you're sort of calling them to the table and said hey what's going on here i mean are, are you really are your priorities really in the right place that you can be successful in this and you know when they're asking that stuff it's not to be a jerk it's to be like all right you know you need something's got to give for you to be successful and we all want you to be successful you know we all want this to work out and that's where all those conversations go it's like i I think you were we were talking about this a little bit earlier you were on the verge of uh, what came to mind for me was when how far you push people or how you set something up so that you know you're not prying into their lives but you got to know enough to know what's going on if they're failing their classes and it's almost always this complicated thing you know it's uh so if somebody's got like a family issue so or they've got like a mental health issue right they're depressed or something like that it's almost always related to family and then if there's a family issue it's almost always related to money and it's this whole complex of things and you you end up getting to these questions where you're sitting down and saying okay life's about timing you know is this the right time for you to be doing this are you overloaded in this part of your life and neglecting this other part of your life or are you neglecting this and you know maybe it's because of another part of your life that maybe you shouldn't be investing in you know but it's always sort of asking those priorities of yourself and that's how people get through that kind of stuff and you know that's the the great thing about advising is sort of figuring out those problems and then get people getting people to the next thing and I, i really enjoy that it's also i think increasingly uh anxiety and depression are a huge part of what you end up talking about and because there's a lot of people out there that just you know they stop going to class or they they won't finish because they've got some kind of anxiety or depression issue do you think i mean we were talking about um it seems the awareness of these things uh has raised in the the post-world war ii era for me it's like it's been talked about we've brought up uh uh, Audie Murphy the other day, mm-hmm. right on the mm-hmm. podcast, talking about how like when he came back because he was famous, everybody cared that he had problems. Yeah, all, like and it became but sort of pre PTSD, but also increasing awareness because people knew that 
these soldiers were coming back and having issues. What, uh, I mean, do you think that's always been a thing? Yeah. In, in literature is where we see it, or do you think it's, it's, there are more anxieties or just there's a larger population? Because I think, uh, I don't know, people living with anxiety and depression, do you think it's accelerated in the digital age? I mean, would you? It's, it, it's I think, yes. I mean, it's all of those things. It's uh, so, you know, for like soldiers coming back from wars, um, you can find, you know, things that from a modern context, you can easily identify, okay, that's PTSD. You know, you'll see people's diaries or their reports or, or things like that. And um, they're talking about their experiences. And, you know, you, you can see some of those things in Civil War literature. You can definitely see in World War One. Right. There's a ton of stuff in World War One. I. I mean, shell shock. Yeah, I was going to say, I call yeah. it shell shock. Yeah. And then in, in World War II, um, you see it all over the place, too, except the, the World War II soldiers, since it, it happened to so many people and so much of society was in, involved in that, um, there was this weird kind of thing where when people were coming back, they just stopped talking about it. And there was also this this weird separation. So uh, you remember when we were doing, we had this interview uh, uh, project that we were doing for the digital history thing. Uh, and we did interviews with Judge Williams here in town. And uh, Judge Williams had, had been with the 4th Infantry and landed at... Uh, uh, I think he landed at Utah Beach. That's where my grandpa landed. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, they made his way, he, you know, they landed in France and then made his way through France and ended up uh, fighting in the Battle of the Bulge and then uh, eventually made their way into Germany. And he was with uh, some of the troops that liberated uh, Dachau. And uh, so, and he... <laughs> He took. He had pictures of this. He he actually picked up a, a camera when he was in France, and he was part of sort of intelligence teams that would do advance work before you going into places. And so yeah. he was one of the advanced people that got to Dachau first and started and took pictures while he was there. And so there's all these, you know, just piles of bodies and stuff from the Holocaust. And uh, but we asked him about it. You know, we did an interview with him and asked him about that experience and. Uh, it was interesting because he, you know, we said, how has that affected you? How has it sort of, has it had an effect on your life? I mean, going through an experience like that, surely. And he said, I hadn't thought about it much. <laughs> and all of the World War II vets that I've interviewed say something very similar. They, it's just, they haven't thought about it. They separated that part of their lives. Compartmentalized it, they buried com it. Completely compartmentalized it and said, okay, that was necessary. And I think they were able to do that in a way because everybody in the United States knew that that was a necessary thing to do to defeat fascism and you know the Holocaust and all of that kind of stuff. It, it was just kind of this assumed thing and so uh i think they didn't feel like they had to talk about it that much and they could compartmentalize it but like the vietnam war vets that i talked to uh when they come back and i interview them um they're much more introverted and reflective about their experience and they're a little bit more willing to talk about their trauma um, you know, they're not completely open to it, but they're, they're more willing. And, you know, they'll talk about the instances when, you know, they actually have to kill somebody. <laughs> Those World War II vets don't. They completely, they don't talk about it. I mean, very rarely. You have to push them into a, a, a difficult place for them to put themselves back there and actually talk about that experience. Vietnam War vets are a little bit more open to that. And then I also did some, some interviews with uh, Gulf War veterans. Um, and they're much more willing to talk about it. And they see it more as a part of something they have to do to kind of get it out. And 
you know, some of those guys are actually, <laughs> I did a couple of interviews where guys were telling me more than they probably should have, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it was, it was a little much. And so I think part of that is, yeah, it's a change in our culture. It's a change in the acceptance of mental health issues and what those are. There's greater knowledge of it. Um, I think, you know, over the generations, too, uh, people are more willing, you know, uh, I think my parents' generation kind of opened up to it, um, particularly if they were, uh, you know, if the 60s and this sort of hippie influence had any <laughs> any impact on them at all. They're a little more willing to talk about their feelings and they're very, it's a very kind of social group and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think my generation... Of, of people uh you know were much more open than their parents to at least the institutional parts of it so taking medicine for it um going to see a therapist that kind of thing yeah. it's still you know i wouldn't say that it's completely open and people are completely you know because there's still this kind of reluctance there's yeah the, there is a, a, a stigma there or yeah. like a, a taboo almost about yeah. mental health but it's definitely heading in the direction of people being more accepting of that right and then but like kids today with their anxiety issues because if you look uh, ucla does a uh, uh does a freshman interview every year and ask freshmen about you know what's keeping them from graduating what's keeping them from moving on in their studies and the instances of anxiety and depression being the main factor that's keeping them from going have just skyrocketed and you see that everywhere and universities are changing completely how they do things to try to adjust to that kind of stuff and i think part of that is just people being more aware, being able to identify that, that, okay, I've got an issue and I need to deal with that. Um, they've grown up, you know, a lot of these kids have grown up with medicine being around everywhere. You know, it started with ADHD and stuff like that and people taking Ritalin. Yeah, no, when I was <laughs> you know, a kid, it was Half Ritalin. the kids are taking Ritalin. <laughs> and, 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 so, you know, I think that kind of chemical thing, I mean, people are, are, are getting more used to it. Um, and I think students really, uh, they want to get that help. They realize that it, it could be an issue for them. It could be a barrier for them. And so they're, they're asking about it more. Um, I do think social media and stuff like that plays a role. Uh, I think people are just more anxious. The more connected you are to other people, obviously the more anxious you're going to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah but you also have access to more knowledge too and so sometimes those can counterbalance each other um i think probably our biggest issue though is an issue that i have I, i've got huge problems with it's uh i think we're we're all dopamine addicts and you know people have traditionally gotten that through alcohol and drugs and things like that but these days we get these fast injections all the time right every time you look at your phone you're getting a little dopamine dump right yeah. you're you're being satisfied in some way it's like you know we talked about people particularly americans needing closure for everything i mean we were, i think we were talking about conspiracy theories right and part of the reason for conspiracy theories is that people need americans especially they they want things to make sense they don't like the chaos they want closure to the story and we, you know, we're a rational society. We're, you know, we are children of the Enlightenment, right? And our whole society is built around that. And so you need closure. You need explanation. And when the, when it's not there, particularly, you know, if somebody's killed in your judicial system and you don't have answers for that, it sort of drives you nuts. But now we've got all these things that can give you answers, right? Whether they're true or not at least you're getting answers at least you're going out and getting that thing and yeah. so that's part of that dopamine thing too right and so you know like i'm a video game junkie really and, I, I don't know if i knew you played yeah <clears throat> and i'm a uh you know i'm a jujitsu junkie and uh you know i am and then i'm kind of a workaholic sometimes 
And all of those things are because, you know, I'm feeding myself the pellet all the time. I'm the rat in the cage feeding myself the pellet. And it, it's just those little dopamine things. And it makes us anxious. It, I mean, and it's, it, it's made me. It's not just something with kids. It's everybody. Yeah. I know I think about this all the time. Like you and I have talked about this. Like it's like I level up all the time as a human being. But then uh like I have talked about this on the podcast recently. Like when I turned 30 and I was about to start doing this the job at the USCCM and like our gym is bigger than ever and it's just like well, just accomplished all my goals and yeah, now right. I'm sitting here watching widespread panic. <laughs> And I don't have to be at these fights in Arkansas. Yeah. And it was just like, just previously I'd had this revelation that Cor and I weren't poor uh, anymore per se. And like, like it was just one of those things like, oh, we have more than $75 in the bank after all the bills are paid. Right. Whoa. <laughs> like, you know, but just like think all these things fall into place and then it creates like a weird self-loathing. So you're like, I got to do more stuff. Yeah. So then like, I'm just, I'm setting all these other goals for myself. And, and, and then it's just like this weird feeling of like, well, is that, I was left feeling empty. The yeah. last time I accomplished all my goals. Yeah, yeah, and you you get used to the pace. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, when you write books, the successful people that are, are writers, you get the book in print, and the satisfaction lasts for about 30 seconds, and you're on to the next thing. And I've always, you know, I wonder about that. that it, why can't you stop and sort of smell the roses? And why can't, it's like, and, and nobody in our society, I think, does that really well. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are a few people, but generally as a culture, we're, we're not that great at that. And we're always pushing for that next thing. And, and I think we've been persuaded that a fulfilling life is constantly conquering kind of the next thing right it's climbing the next mountain you've done this thing so you got to up your game and, and take on whatever the next thing is and it's a very sort of western uh worldview to get into that i think you know in in more eastern philosophies and buddhism and things like that things are more circular you're actually slowing things down a lot uh, you know, you're simplifying, right? Um, but we're constantly seeking something that's more complex. And we're, hey, we're almost for, just for the, f just so we can get fulfillment, which might not exist. <laughs> like, here's another way I've been thinking about yeah. this. Like, you think Justin Rader knows how important he is? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I mean, he's one of the most enlightened jujitsu people I've ever heard speak. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just like, like uh, I've been talk having a similar conversation with Nate Murdoch recently yeah, yeah. and I'm just like because he's he's bringing up Justin Ray to me he's like that guy's enlightened about you just man's blowing my mind and yeah. I was like bro I, I think about you that same way yeah. yeah like it's like people that are this major like let's say yourself I was joking yeah. earlier about you being talked about on this podcast it's because you've made a big impact on people's lives so much so that you probably have no idea. Well, and it's it, it's not just that. I mean, I think people have some inc inkling that they've had an influence on people, but admitting that to yourself is also an act of ego and selfishness, which is another thing that you know we're constantly trying to teach ourselves to avoid. And so there's this tension, right? I mean, we are this one thing and we're constantly driven, you know, we're giving ourselves the more and more complex dopamine injections every day, however we get that. And we're constantly trying to achieve new things. <clears throat> and we think that that leads to this fulfilling life. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but we're also aware that we don't want to be selfish and greedy and uh narcissistic 
and you know we're constantly talking about ego in jujitsu and sort of diminishing your ego and we had a conversation about that recently did we not about whether or not killing your ego is a good thing yeah it was a question my dad asked me yeah what i mean so you care to rehash it up because i've thought about it a handful of times since because it's kind of trendy because to say that you're the you know i'm just real humble you know i just yeah humblest person yeah and and you want to be you know we like people that are self-effacing you know and and that will sort of make fun of themselves and not take themselves too seriously um because then we know they're they're not too full of themselves and it's you know egalitarian societies kind of need that right yeah (laughs) but my dad was asking um so i've got a uh i've got a cousin who is close to the family and they come in for thanksgiving and stuff and she just got engaged to this guy who is uh he's a brown belt in jujitsu in colorado and teaches a bunch of classes and score yeah yeah family he's, reunions he's a great better. dude he's he actually uh fought a couple of guys that i know uh or he grappled with a couple of guys that i know john and grapple with uh, oh, okay who's the guy uh williams or williamson from oklahoma uh african-american guy Oh, Kevin. Kevin. I've even grappled against Kevin yeah. in a match, yeah. Yeah, so he's grappled against Kevin before. He toe-holded me. I, and I think he toe-holded Bruce, too. So. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so I, I hit a sweet foot sweep this morning, and I thought about Kevin. Because, uh, you know, that Seth uh, Seth Daniels from Fight to Win, he foot sweeps everybody. Yeah, yeah. Right, he's got viral videos. Well, he taught that to Kevin, because Kevin's a brown belt champ forever. Yeah. Uh, and Kevin does it to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And through watching those two guys, I hit like it's you grab their head and just hit the foot sweep. <laughs> and I hit it on Nick, and I was like, oh, that was awesome. Then he ankle picked me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. Nick from Sign Hub. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, Kevin Williams is good yeah, in yeah. jiu-jitsu. And so, you know, I, uh, anyway, so bruce legitimate we so i was talking to bruce over thanksgiving about jujitsu and we sort of agreed that you know part of it is part of being good at jujitsu is that sort of elimination of ego because when if you are if you're too self-aware or you're too angry or emotion comes into play while you're grappling you're really vulnerable to mistakes. And so we're constantly seeking this kind of neutral mental ground. Uh, it's a middle way that's just like what Hickson talks about with physicality. There's also kind of mental middle way, right? And part of that involves the, the check on your ego. But my dad, <laughs> my dad, <laughs> I've, I've talked about my dad to you before, but my dad's kind of a maniac. He's... <laughs> Uh, his ligament, ligament in his knee. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the one story I always remember. The dude snapped a ligament in his knee and was completely unaware of it, and his body just ate it. And so he went in for knee surgery once, and they said, where's this ligament? <laughs> and, and Dad said, I don't know. <laughs> so, oh, and man. Dad has abused his body constantly, and it, it's part of, um, honestly, you know, that sort of, dopamine thing that addiction kind of thing i get a lot of that from my parents and they're they're both sort of manic athletes and part of it is sort of philosophical i mean for my dad it's about sucking every minute out of life that 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 you can um but it's also akin to you know i don't i don't think i've ever told him that this is sort of my perspective on it but it's it it gets close to like uh young women who cut themselves (laughs) to sort of reinforce that they're alive dad's got a little bit of that in him he's got that kind of masochist sort of thing going on um but he was a football player and he plays every sport whether it's tennis racquetball golf plays it like a football player and so <laughs> I had that problem with basketball, man. I yeah, don't yeah. know why. I was trying to tackle people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everything's aggressive and everything's an act of will. And so, you know, the only way he's not a big dude, but he's a strong guy and has this incredible will to overcome. And so his argument was that that will 
is an expression of ego. And that competition itself is an expression of will. And it's a, you know, it is a competition of wills. Who wants it more? Who's willing to go farther? And uh, so he was saying that if you eliminate your ego, how can you overcome when things are getting really tough? And I thought about that, and I've been talking to like, um, I think I mentioned it to McMillan the other day, Josh McMillan, and we were talking a little bit about it, and we were talking about, because the, the, the next thing, the sort of evolution of that conversation for me had to do with the difference between a fighter and a warrior. And so a fighter is much more will-driven, right? It's conquering the thing right in front of you, and you give everything to win that match including your body and your longevity and and all that kind of stuff Um, fighters might win the day but in the long run they're going to destroy themselves they're going to get just jacked up like my dad they're going to get two new knees (laughs) you know stuff like that but a warrior they fight for the next day it's not just for this day it's for the days to come. And so, you know, particularly as an older grappler, I have to take that philosophy, you know? Because if I fight for today and, like, I'm in the gym and it becomes an act of will and, you know, I'm rolling with, you know, Justin or Jerry or one of these guys that's just, they're big, strong guys are a lot bigger than me and they're much younger and they're much more physical than I am. And if it comes into just a basic physical thing, you know, they're, my will will be crushed. I cannot compete with that. But, you know, I still know more than they do. <laughs> uh, and I can still, uh, I can regulate my pace better than they can just because of experience, just for doing it all those years. Are you at 10 years yet? Yeah, I thought you. I mean, I thought you were past ten, your ten year mark. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's crazy, man. Yeah, <laughs> I think this year is ten years, is yeah. it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. No, I know. Uh, and so I've got to have that warrior mentality, right? I can't be the fighter, and I'm not in a place where you know an act of will is going to get me to where I need to be. It's more of this sort of neutral pacing ground that serves me better. And so I kind of come to the conclusion that um, that's both right and wrong, you know? And I'm both right and wrong about these things. It kind of, you know... You've got to strike the mean. Yeah, yeah, it's situational, you know? And it it depends on who you are. And and, uh, so it's it's like what what Bruno was talking about. You remember when Bastos was here and he was talking about you have to... The first thing that you ask when somebody goes into a competition is, you know, what are you in this for? Right? Why are you doing this? What are your goals? And what he was getting at is that that's different for everybody and it's personal. Maybe it's not winning that tournament. When he, he, he based his expectations at meeting their that's what yeah. was remarkable to me. This yeah. is like a somebody that works with athletes and is a coach on the sports side and works with hobbies and practitioners that just want self defense and fitness. Yeah. But I was just like, man, you just got to meet them at their own individual needs. Yeah. Because it's not the same. Yeah, and you you know you'll find that as a teacher too, right? So in your classes, and you know we teach to people as a class because we have to. You know, it's the only way it makes economic sense these days and less and less so because you know you can get to people on the internet for (laughs) you know so you can have these enormous classes right but we teach to to classes but you know bruno's philosophy and all of that is that you know you teach the individual and that's got great merit it's awesome if you have the time and you have the resources to do it trouble is most of us don't you know and as the gym gets bigger the individual time that you can spend with somebody. You know, I caught you, when I first started doing jujitsu, to my mind, I caught you at the perfect time. For sure. You didn't know everything, but you knew 
more than I did and enough to teach me. And you were a good enough teacher. You were my number one training partner, man. Well, but that's the thing. We did, we did, we did one-on-one lessons for what almost two years it was a while it was a good time because we did yeah. we were we we started doing privates at the the building we're about to buy yeah, that's right yeah. by the way back to back. full circle yeah. um and then we like the whole time at river valley we were doing um yeah. private lessons there and yeah. i think we we started a noon class around that time yeah. and then at some point We'd we bring did some the, people in every <laughs> once in a while but it was mainly us yeah right? It, it, we started. Well, I think when we started uh, at the very first Forza location, we started having the because the Friday open mat is your private lesson spot. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I always like. I always think about that. I'm just like it's Jeff with the private lesson spot. <laughs> yeah. Well, now we got two of them. I'm doing them at noon. I can't do them in the afternoon anymore. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, that's exploded. It's been great. Uh, that uh, hey, I've heard nothing but good things. Like, we went today. I'm exhausted. So. <laughs> that's great, man. Like okay, so like you get the opportunity to go home a little earlier now, huh? Yeah, yeah. With the new with the job change for sure. You have more time. Is I mean you? Yeah. Is that been great for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's. Uh, well, and um, it ties in with all of the sort of stress and dopamine addiction and things like that, you know. And so I was on this upward trajectory and doing administration for so long that, uh, and it, it's more and more work and more and more responsibility. And I don't mind that. I love helping people and doing that kind of stuff. But it was also taking a kind of personal toll, right? Yeah, and then I got sick last year. Yeah, and, I remember that man. Uh, you know, so I had the staph infection, and then so you were in the hospital twice for that, or yeah. Just well, I was in the first time for the staph infection, and it was it, it was MRSA, so it was it didn't want to didn't want to die, <laughs> and so we had to treat it with these really hardcore antibiotics. Uh, but that sort of killed everything in my body, and yeah. so my resistance to other things went down, and so I caught the secondary infection, C diff or something yeah, like that. C diff. I've Which heard really I've common. heard that s- several times. You the first time I'd heard anything about that, and then I've I just I was aware of it. So yeah. I've heard it two or three times. It's since. it's really common, and that, but and like the way you feel is you know makes the. Uh, Damon's kid had C diff. Oh really? Yeah, oh, Damon man. from the gym. That's, that's what made me think of it. That's awful. Yeah. Because it, it's the uh, the staph infection isn't too bad to deal with. You know, it's a little fever and some stuff like that. The C. diff, it's like having dysentery, man. I mean, it, you know, so you can't keep fluids in at all. And it completely dehydrates you. And you, you, you just, you know, <laughs> it, it made my blood pressure go down so low that it was, you know, the machines that they hook you up to. It was setting off the machines. Is this like, guy alive? I was in, yeah, it, is this guy alive still? Is he in cardiac wow, arrest? Man. And so I was, I got pretty low. I was pretty dry <laughs> by the end of that. And so, but anyway, that that kind of experience, and I don't want to overblow it because you know I was fine, and the hospital did a great job, and doctors did a great job and stuff. But it, it does give you a different perspective. Were you in Conway? Conway? Yeah. Hospital. Yeah, Conway Regional is yeah. great. That's where Cora wants to have our child. Yeah, Conway Regional is awesome. I got the hookup for you too. My wife's on the on the board. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Cora, like we're we're planning right now. Yeah. So yeah, uh, not trying. Yeah, planning. Understood. <laughs> It's okay. all very delicate. <laughs> so it's, it's, the timeline is being followed. The schedule, of the, the order of operations. I understand. How old were you when you had your first kid? I was. T- uh, it's 29. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Good. See, of course she's fine. Was, yeah. was your wife the same age? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, uh, anyway, I, I think all of that experience sort of made me think more about what I was doing and where I was heading and, and that kind of thing. And so going back to the classroom and teaching people, which is something that I've loved and I've really missed. And then getting back to writing and doing something creative along those lines and still having my sort of toes in administrative work with the governor school stuff. That was a perfect kind of mix for me. And I got to a place where, you know, the decision's not about money. It's not about sort of 
taking the next step on some path that somebody thinks, you know, should be the next thing. It was completely a decision about, okay, what do you want to do? What's, you know, what's most fulfilling to you as a person and not as sort of a career or some kind of big goal oriented thing. And what's going to be better for your relationships with your family and your friends and all those kinds of things. And it was absolutely clear, you know, you go back to the classroom, give yourself some more time. You can cut out early on a Friday every once in a while and (laughs) and go do a podcast. You were that kind of stuff. You were an administrator. Okay. So I, I met you at the right time to, cause right. I was, I did that ADHI, uh, uh, independent study, special problems, whatever it, it's called with you. Yeah. And that's when I, you asked me about jujitsu. Yeah. But you were in where I, th- I don't know if Jeff Pearson's still down there, but at the very end of the hall on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but that's what, and then I remember coming back to ask, uh, to apply for a job. And I don't know if, I don't know if Paul was secretary at that time or who was, but they were like, Oh yeah. You know, Jeff was a department head now. And you know, <laughs> yeah. he said to hire you yeah. and I was like, Oh, but th- like literally my, f- my year back. And that was, yeah. I worked with you in the summer. So I went back in the spring semester and I worked with you in the summer. And then that was my first fall back. Yeah. I was, I'd taken off from like my first semester after high school until then to when I was 23 years old. Yeah. Right. And, um, that's how you were just started to be the department head. And I think you were teaching like two classes a semester at yep. that time, like Vietnam war. I got to take you for espionage. You got yeah. to take you summer class 45 to present. Yeah. But you were like, I'm going to say like one foot out the door, but I mean, you were teaching half what you were when I first met you. Yeah. And it, it, that's, that was a good balance for me. And that's kind of the balance that I wanted back, you know, cause you, you can do some administrative stuff and, and, you know, you need to be there for that kind of thing, but you're, you know, you're only teaching a couple of classes and it, it's, uh, it's good. It gives you some room and the, but the Dean thing can be sort of, it's pretty consuming and there's a lot of extra time that you have to give. And, you know, there's a lot of weekends and nights and, and that's you travel a lot. Do you have to go out of state a lot? Uh, no, actually I, I probably traveled more when I was a professor, but that's because I was doing research and things like that. When I did go out of town as a dean, it's only it's it's going to conferences or some kind of professional development thing. Uh, it's not nearly as interesting or fun. <laughs> uh, but no, there, there's a lot of things like you know you just have to go to events all the time. Yeah, yeah. you know there's a lot of rubber chicken kind of things that you have to do, and those are just a drag. Yeah, I feel for McMillan on that. He yeah. he is at he's at everything. Yeah, he's at everything. I don't even know well, how he comes his, to the gym every day. Well, and his job is really wacky, man. I mean, he's he's sort of constantly on call. He he handles it so well, man. I've never even seen him lose cool. I, I know. I, I know. He does get, you know, I think he gets spread thin like anybody. But he's also got such great perspective on yeah. it, you know? We're cut from the same cloth because, like, Cora like all three of us Corey the other day was like I don't know how McMillan does it he's like the busiest guy I know and he's like hey can I start teaching three classes a week at this gym and we're just like sure dude whatever you want I know. <laughs> just, I know. it's like are the, you're already the busiest dude I know I know but he's got I mean and we've talked about it before and I don't think I'm I'm revealing too much about uh, about Josh in this but he's got the, some of the same kind of tendencies that, that I was talking sure. about you know if he sees something that he feels like he can make a difference in or do some good you know that's he's he's gonna feed himself the pellet yeah you i'm know? super <laughs> grateful for that i'm so glad he got yeah. involved with this when uh, just when he did and everything it let me tell you a funny josh mcmillan story real quick i joke with him about this all the time so when we were downtown splitting rent with rvma and i just started working with Hausnick. yeah we we're bringing Hausnick into the fold yeah and um I was doing a private with housing. They were going to have like the Christmas parade or something, man. And I was like super broke. Okay. So like doing $20 private lesson or whatever I was doing, was like how I like lived, you know, I mean, I made a little bit of money at the gym, worked on, on campus and this and that, but McMillan, who I don't know at all, he comes in he's like, Hey, sir, 
well, you know, I need you to move your car out front. And I'm just like, dude, I'm in here making a living. All right. Like I ain't going to move my car. You can't make me do it. <laughs> like basically was how the conversation went. I'm, I'm back here working with this guy. He's paying me for my time and I am not going to move my car, but I will after I'm done, you know? And that was like basically it. And then after he leaves, Kyle from the gym comes yeah. over and he's like, Hey man, that was Josh McMillan from Crow Mountain Dojo. And I was like, whatever. Cool. Like that's like one of the first times I think I'd ever heard his name. And then like after way after the fact, I like have become friends with Josh. And I remember this story and I was just like, I got to ask him about that. That's so great. man. But I mean, dude, I was a stupid kid at the time. And I was man, like life was life was rough at that period when I was like, just getting back into school, living in Russellville and just moved back up here broke. Well, and you were emaciated all the time. Because you were fighting. I remember you looked like you look like this kid that had been in prison. Your hair was all shaved. (laughs) You know, you're just skinny. You hadn't eaten in in weeks, but you're, you know, you're just abusing your body every day. And then you're trying to go to school and do all this other kind of stuff. Yeah, you were a little edgy. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Particularly during that time, I want to say I had a fight that year. Uh, oh, yeah. If this, because it's like that would have been like 2010. That's the last time I had an MMA fight. So, yeah, and it may have been the one where you uh, you injured yourself. Yeah, like collarbone. My, or whatever? Uh, okay, no, that was at a sem- That was about the very first judo seminar I went to. I always joke with people. I'm like, go to a judo seminar, break a collarbone get a black belt in that art <laughs> like, it's like they, but it was very yeah, much yeah. so like i'll show that martial art yeah <laughs> fortunately which yeah it's the next mountain right it's the will thing <laughs> yeah but man i will say more so than anything i started doing judo because i didn't want to be the stereotypical jujitsu school that sucks oh, at getting it to the floor oh no well and we've got so many judo influences around us josh I mean, yeah, Josh is one of them, and you know, and uh, uh, you know, I guess Caleb had a, a a black belt as well, and didn't. I don't know if he had a black belt in judo, but I mean, Dean, you know, Mr. Dean's his dad, and he does have a black belt right. in judo. But Caleb, right. Caleb had a black belt in keto. Okay, yeah. yeah. So did Nate. Nate had a black belt in judo. Yeah, I was going to say I, I thought Nate did too. Yeah, so yes. yeah. So there, I mean, there was all these people with that influence. So yeah, of course, and and that's what that was my first martial art. That was when I was yeah yeah yeah. When I, I was a little you, kid. <laughs> remember you telling me about that? It didn't last long. Check out this. Here's a a bomb for you, which um, I don't think this is confidential. But Nate is no longer coaching martial arts. Really? Yes. Wow. Moment of silence. I know, dude. I was bummed out for like a day because, like, what I said earlier, I was like, I literally did say that to Nate. He was telling me that that Justin Ray was blowing his mind and all this. And I was like, dude, you're that to me, man. Everything you're saying about Justin, yeah, he's cool. I feel that way about him too. But I was like, I feel that way about you, dude. I was like, you've shown me this and uh, this move and this caused me to go off here and remember this. And what about this time that we're doing this? And you and I discovered that calf crusher. Is he moving on to something else? Or I mean, he has just... a finance degree. He's He got a job in finance. Okay. Uh, so, but um, I'm sure he's going to still train, but okay. he's yeah. not going to be i mean to my knowledge like i talked to him he's not gonna be involved and I, um like when i heard he was gonna do that i was like dude do you want to partner with me <laughs> i was yeah. like we'll do we'll open two more gyms right now like yeah. i'll work at them you can work at the Russellville gym i was yeah. like i'll build them up you know because i was yeah. just like that's the saddest thing i've heard in a minute i know well <clears throat> you know what will happen though it'll come back around and i know he's he's probably doing that for his job and and that kind of stuff right now mm-hmm. but if he's my, he's tired of being poor well yeah his student loans. And, and he needs to do that right uh, but my experience with jujitsu is and, and even as somebody who you know i'm much more recreational than you guys i mean you guys are professionals at this kind of stuff i'm trying to i'm trying to go back down to your <laughs> level with this okay yeah. uh, but teaching to me is such a big part of learning jujitsu now that I have a hard time separating it. You know, I have to teach to sort of 
Get Are you anywhere. feeling fulfilled t- teaching a new oh, class, I man? I love it, Good man. Dude. I love teaching. Because, like, honestly, man, I felt yeah. bad when I when I started working at the university because I felt like I was, like, abandoning everybody. No, no. And then, like, I was over um, relying on people or whatever. And, I mean, it's balanced out perfectly. I'm at the gym every day, no, I love all it. weekend. You know, it's... And I owe you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll teach for free for as long as you guys want me to. <laughs> man, that's what's cool is is that it's it's become about like like what you're saying with that friday class you started like yeah. i want more of that like yeah. it's it, it's too much for cora and i to even it's not about us anymore i mean it is like people like to well, like it's got a community man. It, it is it is a community very much so yeah. but i i always wanted it to reach this stature or whatever but yeah. and i am honestly hoping and like because I told like Nate and I had a lot of conversations over the last few weeks and I was just like I I, I told him because I was just like constantly probing him I'm like because I didn't want to yeah. in the back of my mind the whole time I was like okay so you're not gonna get coach anymore for these reasons like wasn't like Nate's, Nate's not like a business guy right yeah. like neither am I but like still the gym is super successful because we put the the things in place to make the business run which makes you a business guy which is a, a funny thing to me because people talk about sort of the dynamics of business and being sort of behind the scenes and looking after all that stuff. You know, to me, and and I say this as somebody who's worked in higher education, you know, you got to focus on what you do and, you know, what people are really there for. And they're, they're there to learn the martial art. And the rest of the stuff, you know, yeah, you got to take care of it, and yeah, you got to worry about it, but that'll fall into place. That's secondary, yeah. right? It's the product, and like in higher education, we get so distracted by all this other kind of crud going on, and it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's teaching people. Yeah, I man, it's been this semester. We don't have a chancellor, whatever a chancellor is, yeah, right. Right? Right. the person that runs things. It's, yeah. So all the other bosses are just like constantly running the university. So we get left alone more than ever right now. Yeah. And I just like never see my boss at at all. And it's just, all I do is teach. And it's like, I get snapped out of the reality. Sometimes we got to go to this like two hour division meeting or something. And I'm just like, I I was, I just, (laughs) I forgot we do this too. (laughs) Like the committees. I've actually, I like uh, the committee I'm serving on. Is helping me. It's an AW committee, like people that drop, yeah. that yeah, get yeah. dropped in appeal. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's how I did that because I'm like I want more. I want to see that side. It's a great thing to learn, man. Yeah, it's good stuff. I, I, you know, actually, the key to me for being a good administrator in college is uh, creating that bubble that you're talking about, and so that teachers, that's what they concentrate on. And I'm not, you know, yeah, we need to partic- them to participate in other things. And yeah, they, they need to sort of see the bigger picture. But at the end of the day, they got to, you know, they got to do that classroom stuff well. And they got to do the, you know, if, if they do research and writing and that's part of their job, that's, you know, they need to do that well. And so anything that you can do to kind of lessen all the other noise going on is going to be helpful. And it's going to help that experience. And, you know, I think... I think probably you and 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 uh, Nate and well, all you guys have that kind of perspective when it comes to the to the gym. You know, Nate's been it, such an influence on me, man. Oh, me too, man. I, I think all of us, and it, you know, I, I think <laughs> yeah, we'll miss him. I'm sort of sad that that uh, he's not going to be teaching, but at the same time, I'm happy for him, and I'm happy that he's taking another step. And honestly, it will come back around. It, it if will. He keeps training. It, it, it'll it'll come back around and he'll probably be better at it for his other experiences yeah you know? i think so too i mean that's like that's what i'm starting to uh, i'm only this is my second year on the job i adjunct a little before that like yeah. a summer and a semester but i mean this is like forging me into a whole other person yeah. it's, it's weird in it, doing other things i want that like i was either too poor or too busy to do yeah that's another game changer like why i empathize with nate where he's at like just on the financial side of like i'm like paying back my student loans fast yeah because i'm like literally i'm like oh yes i already have this other income 
yeah. which I've been living off of for five years. So like we just throw the student loans at, or, or the whole history job at yeah. student loans and leisure. Yeah. Well, and don't you think too, just all around, you're a more interesting person since you started doing that job. I feel like I'm learning all the time. I think I did. I say to you one time, I'm like, do you feel like you just kept getting smarter when you were 30, man? Yeah. Like, cause I, I was, I, yeah. I thought, I don't know. I just like, it was weird. I was like, I'm, I'm out of college and I learned those things and they're not going to mean anything else other than what I thought about them being today. It's, it's the beginning, man. It's not the end. It's like what people say about a black belt, you know, man, what you were saying about the warrior thing earlier, that got me thinking, have you listened to the new tool album? That yeah, song yeah, invincible. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much the theme of that old song. Yeah. Like the old warrior that's 50 years old, yep. like Maynard's got an artificial hip going. He's still going to go out to no, battle. I heard the first line in that, and I was like, oh, this is a jujitsu song. <laughs> what about um, that? So what got me back into stoic? So like everything I'm revisiting yeah. now at 32 means something else. Yeah. Like, so I've just been getting back into stoicism. And like you uh, brought some things up recently, I'll go back down the rabbit hole and, and I just interpret them in a whole new way yeah. or it's nostalgic. I'm like relearning something I forgot. Yeah. And it, but uh, stoicism, uh, that Numa song from that tool album. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a stoic term for yeah. uh, life force, right? Yeah. But um, it's got me like back down in the Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. And yeah, that's actually one of my favorite tracks on the. Yeah, that is my favorite track. Yeah. 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 Uh, we're going to see him in Tulsa. Oh, are you? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'll uh, hit Little Rock. Uh, but because that last time we couldn't go see him at Tulsa in like 2014 or something like that. Yeah. But the, um, then after we missed out on Tulsa tickets, they came to Little Rock. So I'd love to meet that guy. Maynard? Yeah. And not in the music setting. I'd like to have him in like for jujitsu class. I mean, I would like Jack was trying to line me up to do a private with him. Yeah. It never happened. He went and saw a perfect circle and I don't know if it'll ever happen. I mean, yeah, it'd be awesome though. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I talk about it periodically cause I'm hoping it happens. Yeah. But at the same time, like he's like, I would just treat him like any other jujitsu student. Like yeah. I probably, I, I, I've met members of panic in the airport. Uh -huh. But I didn't meet him because I was just like, I just like worshiping you from afar. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I was like, you, you like, I've seen, I've seen hundreds of people take pictures with you on the internet. Like, I don't, I don't want you, I don't want to be that person for you. Well, and I don't want to ruin that relationship that I have with your art by putting you in the way of that. You know, what I have a, is a relationship with your art, not with you. Oh, that's a great. But with Maynard, like I've got this relationship with his music that is great i don't need to touch that but i know he likes something that i like and i'd be much more interested i know in I know. talking to him about that well and to the the fascination like he will only apparently he's been doing tie boxing because i he was just on the joe rogan recently yeah but apparently he will only work with people who have worked with hickson or like do that hickson style yeah that's why jack was trying to line me up with him because it was like right after i'd done those seminars and yeah right Jack had just come in. I'd just done privates with Jack and stuff. So it was, he was just like, dude, if if he's in the area, I will try and hook you up because I know his, like the guy that runs security or for his tour or something. Yeah. Man, but like that guy. Restaurant. Why, Jack had lunch with him at his restaurant. Okay. Wine industry. So many different Three things. bands. Yeah. And the, the uh, you ever listen to Pussifer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah man yeah I know. <laughs> that mia jovovich song that what do you know that's I, know. I, I forget the title of it it's my favorite it's one. all great stuff i mean I, I uh i constantly it's like a regular thing for me to go back to they did there's a youtube video of uh a tool from the early 90s i mean it was like right when they were getting started it was like 92 or something yeah. like that and he used to do this thing where he would just stare at somebody in the crowd and basically like sing to this person and just it's like he's ripping their soul apart and it's one of the most like amazing sort of concert 
things that I've ever seen. It's like he's he's possessed and he's taken over this dude's body in the crowd. It's like he's going in through his eyes, man. And it, it is the most intense thing that I think I've ever seen. And I, I've had huge respect for that as like an artist and an entertainer. But I do not want to know what's going through his head when he's doing that. <laughs> you know, I want to respect that from afar. I don't that want guy. <laughs> I mean, the whole band, you know, Danny Carey's obsessed with Aleister Crowley. Yeah. Adam Jones wears socks with his sandals now. <laughs> like it's, it's a crazy thing. Well, it's on uh, when Maynard's on Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan's like, so about that song with the Fibonacci sequence. He's like, Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> I think we accidentally did that. I don't think it was. A, we didn't do that on purpose. We just realized that we had done it. And I was just like, don't you take that from us, Maynard. Yeah. But I mean, him choking the fan. That's the greatest oh, video. Yeah, like, he's great. like, he's like, hey, give me a hug, buddy. We, we, that came up the other day. That's iconic. Anytime I talk to people about Tool, they bring that up. Say, no, I do martial arts. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. it's funny. But I love that sort of... Um, I love that kind of intensity in music and in art. It's something that I've always been really kind of drawn to. And I think it's that, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's that dopamine dump thing. You know, I like the, I'm a, you know, I'm a adre- adrenaline fueled kind of person. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about sort of balance in your, in your life and, one of the reasons that jujitsu has sort of saved me person is that it's balanced out all those other things and it's given me perspective on it. And so, you know, I can go in and have this really primal, visceral experience every day and get that adrenaline sort of dump. And I mean, I can control it now, but it's still there and it's still on the edge and it still puts you in this sort of heightened place but then i can go back to my work and sort of be calm and not have to like i don't have to be like my dad and beat the thing to death it, you know i don't have to tackle but it like a could. football player <laughs> i could if i wanted to and, and i can when i need to but i'm probably better at the job by not doing that by having better perspective and having more balance, you know? And so, you know, a lot of my life now is creating balance for myself between a lot of things, because I think in the end, it's more interesting and meaningful for me than sort of, you know, chasing things too hard and getting the balance whacked out of shape, you know? And maybe that's a late life kind of thing. Maybe that's a, you know, I turn 50 next year. So maybe that's a turning 50 thing or something. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different perspective, but it's, uh, it's been good for me. <laughs> so you, you did turn 50, you turned 49. I, I, I turned 49 in August. And so I'll turn 50. All right. So um, how was the Foo Fighters concert? <laughs> we haven't even talked about that. It was awesome, man. And I've seen the Foo Fighters like uh, a half a dozen times, something like that. Are they like your favorite band, would you say? Or just like one of them? Yeah, one of them. I mean, I, I like music too much to sort of pin myself down. To make a whole widespread um, panic room. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the good thing about widespread panic is that they play so much stuff that it's, like, it's not like one band. Yes. So. I, well, and yeah. it's they've had their guitar player died and he was such a big influence that there's that era. Yeah. It's, right. it's in eras now. Right. You know? But, uh, for me, you know, and it's like, I feel like <laughs> I kind of have this relationship with Dave Grohl, <laughs> but not with Dave Grohl with his music and, and with, you know, so I was a big Nirvana fan and, and stuff when I was in college and, all that stuff was exploding right when I, was. I almost bought a Jag Stang the other day, man. And I was thinking, you said you had one, right? A Jag Stang, a Fender Jag Stang. Uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, um, it, yeah, I have a '64 Fender Mustang. Which okay, is must of, a Mustang. Yeah, okay. but it's it's essentially what you're talking it's about. Like the ja- yeah, same yeah, yeah. body type. 
Yes. Um, but yeah, it was Kurt Cobain's sort of go-to guitar. Man, if Corey knew, I was, like, I, I was, the guy was wanting 800 bucks for it. And it was like a reissue, super nice. And I was, I got him like, I was, I was like low balling a little bit. And I got him down to like 600 bucks is what he was saying he would take. And I was like at 550, like totally willing to pay him $600. And then he got, he was just like, never mind, man. I don't want to sell it anymore. And I was just like, dude, I'll give you 600 bucks. And he's like, I changed my mind. And I was like, no. Yeah. I bought it. Uh, that guitar was the first guitar that I ever had. My parents bought it for me in 1980. Uh, so I was 10 years old. Wow. <clears throat> You've been and, playing that long. Wow. Not really. I've had the guitar that long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, playing comes and goes. Uh, <clears throat> but I think they bought it. They bought that and a uh, Fender tube amp. Uh, I think they paid a hundred bucks. Oh yeah, amp. but uh, okay. So there's a Fender Jaguar and there's a Fender Mustang. It's a it's a Fender Mustang. It's a '64. So it was before Fender became the big corporation was bought out. It yeah. was still the family owned part. Oh, that's a beautiful guitar. And it was it was awesome. And now it's worth like you know. It's like twelve hundred dollars or something like that. Yeah. It was an old pawn shop guitar, you know, because yeah, it, it used to be like, yeah, yeah, and it's the blue one. It's exactly that. Yeah, one. yeah. That's uh, that's a beautiful color. What's that called? Like sea it's sea foam, foam green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've Which always is actually blue, but they call it sea foam green. I've always I've always wanted. Um, like I've got a Tele and a Strat in there. I, I rarely yeah. play the Strat. I just got. I scored a super cheap. Um, I'm always raiding the marketplace for guitars, man. Then I redo them. So I scored a super cheap Affinity Strat. Really <laughs> nice condition. Good frets. And I turned in a Tom DeLonge guitar. <laughs> nice. Like remember the Tom DeLonge Blink One Two with the double? Yeah, yeah. No, There's no tone switch. It's yeah. just a single volume yeah. knob. Yeah, real simple. I used to put stripes on it. You know, yeah. <laughs> back from my pop punk days, that's right. my indie rock. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's all I can play. But that's, you know, that that's that kind of Nirvana influence and stuff too. Because, you know, that stuff is really simple. Um, Cora saying, uh, where, did, where, uh, where did you sleep last night the other day? She's just like, hey, I want to play that. And I like, pulled it up right in here and started playing it. And she was, she takes vocal lessons on the download, doesn't even really... But she, had, like, sometimes she'll be singing with me. And it makes me cry. I know. I'm just like, you have the voice of an angel. Yeah. Like, it's. No, she, uh, people don't see the the drama and uh, singing side of Cora oh, I <laughs> anymore. Know. It used to be your big thing. I told her, I was like, they, uh, they asked me if she'd be interested in doing something with uh, this pageant at UACC. I was like, Corey, you should get like sing or something, be yeah. some entertainment. Like it's, we, you know, they were, and she's just like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I told him you won Miss Congeniality and best vocal talent at Miss Tech that one time. And you've been in like 20 plays. But yeah, she's, I mean, she, she'll get to arguing with me every now and then about like how to do the, my podcast or something. She's like, I have a communications degree. <laughs> yeah, she brings it up. And, it well, and then we'll be arguing about history, and then she goes, "I have a history degree." <laughs> like it's, she's got both. I uh, know she so, no, she can do. She does all kinds of stuff. She's a super talented person. Yeah, she. I, I'm. I've lucked out. She does such a good yeah. job in all all things that we're doing. Same thing with my wife. She's you know she's like this amazing piano player and never plays. And she's a great singer. She's constantly singing, but she just makes crap up. She's just being silly with the kids and stuff yeah. like that. But yeah, she's incredibly talented. And never, you know, she just doesn't doesn't indulge that anymore. I keep trying yeah. to get her to. But anyway, that um, you asked about the concert. Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah. it was in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, and it was this outdoor thing. It's like you know seventy thousand people. Wow, and it was awesome i'd never had that you know i've done i've gone to a lot of concerts a lot of indoor concerts and i've i've, I've done some kinds of the festivals thing but they're you know they're never that kind of packed in sort of experience that sometimes you see 
And this was that packed in kind of experience. Just a ton of people. They love them in Scotland. Did you feel, uh, did that stress you out at all? No, it was awesome. Stressed out my wife a little bit because uh, this one lady tried to pickpocket her. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I've only had like, one minor incident at an outdoor show and somebody like fell on us. It was super yeah, trashed. And it, and it wasn't, uh, it had rained a bunch and uh so it was all muddy uh-huh. and so you know you couldn't move too fast people are gonna fall down all over the place and nobody wanted to fall into the mud and so it was kind of tame that way but it was uh it, nah it was it i was hate great, leaving man. big festivals like that that's when it gets stressful for me. i've never felt like i was sardine packed in absolutely. like you see the photo like the 420 fest is thirty five thousand people there. absolutely leaving is the most dangerous time always for those things because then you know people are all either drunk or drugged out of their minds or anything like that and have you seen anything like uh this is happening like crazy at shows we go to uh the nitrous mafia yeah have you seen that in yeah. the shows you've been to isn't yeah. that cr- like when we were in nashville yeah it literally kind of scared me oh yeah because there's just like well if you're high is just killing brain cells <laughs> you got you got issues man it, that's all that does it was it was super weird uh how like i don't know i just like i was like everywhere we turned they were like i had a tank and they were blowing up balloons and i was yeah. like man yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I mean, we I didn't even it, it was that Memphis show that I went to with that we were talking about earlier. That's the yeah. first time I'd even knew it was a thing. There's documentaries about them on YouTube, but yeah. like, what's crazy is that they let them do it. Oh, I know, I know. At all of these shows I'm going to, it is being allowed. Yeah, and that's um, I I don't know. I guess is not a law against it, or somebody's getting paid off. I don't know. Yeah, well, and it, I don't know. That was always, I think, well, and it's probably like you too. I mean, you know, for all of the abuse that I put on my body and, you know, and I've been willing to experiment with drugs and do all that kind of stuff. And, um, but I got to be respectful of those brain cells because you know, a big part of my life is up here in my head and I like that part of my life and I don't want to kill that part of my life, you know? And so part of my aversion to those kinds of things is that, you know, uh, it's that it's a personal thing, you know, it's, it's, I can't imagine somebody with enough self loathing to just destroy their minds and, you know, for whatever temporary fix they get from that. Yeah. Yeah. We, I posed this question on, I think the podcast channel the other day, but, um, Rob zombie is who said it. And I was like, Oh dude, that's a, but is learning from the mistakes of others even a thing? Oh yeah. (laughs) You know? And I was like, I've never thought about that. And I mean, it's really yes and no, because there's so many examples of where people, don't learn from others other other mistakes family examples not sure. breaking the the yeah. the familial cycle yeah. of uh yeah. behavior yeah the, the thing is we don't have a job if people only learn through personal experience you know yeah uh, cuz part of the reason we exist and also as a as a species um you know part of what makes us unique and uh um, sort of um, evolutionarily uh, gifted is that we have that ability to learn from others and to empathize and to, you know, uh, anticipate what might happen before it happens. And so, you know, part of what's deep about that question is that if if you don't accept the idea that we can learn from other people's mistakes we are um you know we're we're just primates we're just dogs we're yeah. just you know, I mean, i've definitely learned from yeah. others mistakes. I, I, I could think of all sorts of instances but in the and then i'm like well what about a heroin addict 
Yeah. Well, that's what he said. He's like, yeah. like, and then I started thinking, I'm like, yeah, John Frusciante had friends die here when then he got addicted. Yeah. To well, but a more interesting question, I think to me than that is, is, um, what do we choose to learn from other people? And what are we able to learn from other people? And then what is it in some of us that doesn't allow us to do that, where we have to have the experience? Because there's plenty of times where that comes up, even with little children, you know? And like you can teach any kid, don't stick your finger in the socket, it's gonna, it's gonna burn you. Right, and they will learn, and and a lot of kids, you know, they'll avoid it for their whole lives if you scare them bad enough. But a lot of kids, you tell them that immediately, they get the fork and go put it in the socket. I know, man. I you know think what I, I mean? did that. <laughs> and, yeah, and so it almost like sets up this need to test it because we're also, you know, as as human beings. You know, we we always talk about the scientific method as as some kind of abstraction. The scientific method is what it is to be human. And so, if we want to experiment, we constantly want to experiment, right? And just because somebody tells you something is true, you know, we're skeptical beings. We don't want to believe that. We want to test it for ourselves. And particularly these days, we got so many people telling us what's true or what's not true that I think we have even a greater urge to find out what's out there and, and, and what's what's true or not and have some kind of personal connection to that. What's interesting as a historian, though, is that you start to understand that uh, you can't. You know, there's a lot of things that you just can't replay the tape. You can experience for yourself, you know. Um, the only way you're going to learn about death is dying. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then you don't get to learn anything else after, at least as far as we know, you know? Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have limits to that, right? Nobody's, you may be able to try heroin until you put yourself into a place where, you know, you're destroying all this other, but it's not about the heroin at that point. It's not about the experimentation. You're doing it because you got, you know, you got other issues or you've got some kind of chemical dependency, right? But there's not a whole bunch of people going to jump off of cliffs uh, to say, I need to experience what that's like. Yeah, I know. It's, it, it's <laughs> weird, the, 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 the situations that it's like you can, the yeah. little case when do you choose to, when do you, when do you have to have the experience and when do you don't? And it, it's this kind of risk reward thing. Uh, that's that's interesting to me. Yeah, yeah man. And then uh, freaking Billy Reader on the podcast last week, man. Um, did you listen to that one by chance? It was good. I, I I listened to like the first five minutes and got distracted with something else. But, he yeah. he brought he brought up this. He was like, "How many people do you think would practice organized religion if there was absolutely zero potential incentive at the end of the game yeah like there is no punishment there yeah. is no reward yeah yeah it's um and i i saw i think he posted something about it on on facebook the I other think, day i think i did or maybe you did, I, I did and then i shared it it's thing. funny uh ironically right as you got here bread text me asking me it, where it was so he could go read it again yeah and uh What's interesting to me about that is that I think we have, I don't know, I daily experience things that are magic to me, that are metaphysical. And I'm a very scientific person, and I'm a very skeptical person, and I, you know, um, I'm, not an, I'm not an atheist, but I'm pretty agnostic. I am too. Um, and so, you know, I accept that I don't know a whole lot. Um, but what I, my greatest faith is not in God in the traditional sense of the way that people think of God, but I have tremendous faith, absolute faith in love. 
and it's something that I see and experience every day. But I don't, you know, I can't do a scientific experiment that proves that. (laughs) But it's really tangible to me. It's really tangible to me. And maybe it's just, you know, you, you can explain it away in all kinds of stuff. You can explain it away in chemical reactions and, and you know, your synapse is firing in a certain way. Or maybe it's, you know, it's like the dopamine dump that we're talking about. It's just a different version of it. Um, but it's, there, I've had too many sort of transcendent experiences with the people that I love to not categorize that as something tangible. And if that's what God is, I'm good with that. That's enough for me. You know, I don't need a whole lot of afterlife stuff. I don't need a whole lot of, um, you know, organized kind of religion. I don't need a lot of ritual. Um, you know, I appreciate those things because sometimes I think people need that stuff and sometimes I need that stuff. But I don't need a lot of it, just personally. Uh, because I think, you know, the the love that I see in, in those other places is it's, it's constant confirmation to me, you know. And I, I'm a pretty optimistic person because of that. Uh, and so... I, you know, I don't know if that's an answer to the kind of question that, that people were posing about that, you know, because I just it, like it, seeing people, uh, people commenting on it. Yeah. Like that. I, I did it more for to get some social media engagement than anything, but also to see people's perspectives. And, yeah. and some people were remarking on the kind of the same avenue that you've taken is that their approach to living w- wasn't necessarily based around the idea of the afterlife some people said that the prospect of seeing their loved ones that are no longer here again was their number one factor yeah like of them believing like they did and it was it was interesting to see the varied reasons people would come up with and you could see some of them obviously rooted in christianity Mm. which you know i've just been saying like to a lot of people lately i'm like hey to each their own man yeah. Like I'm not, I'm oh, not sure. even arguing with you or judging you or anything. I just, I personally don't believe that way, but you do. And I still, your friend, oh, you for know, sure. for sure. And I, I, you know, I tend towards sort of pantheistic views anyway. And so, uh, it's not that I believe in sort of many gods or anything, but I, I believe in many expressions of God. Marduk, Baal, Dagon, <laughs> just in Mesopotamia. Yeah. Going, going deep ancient stuff. Man, there. I've been I've been down a neo Babylonian rabbit hole. Okay. Yeah, but uh, so I, you know, uh, I don't. The structure, I think, comes in many ways, and even something like science provides a kind of meaningful structure for me in terms of, you know, philosophy and metaphysics and things like that. I mean, just the fact, you know, just the fact that mass and energy never changes, that it's a constant, means that, you know, all of our atoms will always exist. And all the atoms that have ever existed still exist. Mm. And there is a sense of immortality in that. And do I have to be structured in the same way at an atomic level to be, you know, satisfied that I'm still part of the universe or that the consciousness that I have right now is necessary for or some similarity to the conscious the consciousness that I have now? is necessary for me to have a fulfilling afterlife. (laughs) And I don't think it is. I mean, you know, it's like I I told my wife and my kids now know that I was like, don't put me in a casket and in a box in the ground, you know. If anything, plant me in a tree. 
And then at least, you know, I'm feeding the dang tree <laughs> and I'm part of the tree, you know, because otherwise, if you burn me up and I think uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about this, you know, if you burn me up, my atoms are dissipated and I, 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 I go out in, into the universe and they're not really feeding anything. If you put me in a, in a concrete box in the ground, you know, I'm decomposing, but I'm not really feeding anything and I'm decomposing at a rate that's so slow that it's you know it, it, it's not really helping anything you plant me in a bulb of a tree <laughs> that's the thing that's it I've, I've been seeing that you know and and people are starting to do that and they have like they have green cemeteries and things like that and it's and so i'm not a fanatic about any of that kind of stuff but that kind of that philosophy that cosmology has appeal to me as somebody who believes in, in, in science, as somebody who believes in, in love, you know, just the, the expressions of that that I have in my life is, is kind of enough. And the fact that that love or that influence that I have on people, you know, we were talking about being a teacher and, and you know, recognizing the, the influence that you might have on, on people. You know, I think teaching is an expression of love in some ways. It's it's kind of a minor one, but it it absolutely does that. There's something sacred about that. So the influences that you've had on other people, that ripples throughout the universe and throughout time. There's a certain amount of immortality in the relationships that we have, you know. And some people, the more people that you're influencing, in some ways, the, the, the longer lasting that will be. The trouble is the more people that you're influencing, the more uh, you might influence them in ways that are probably not healthy. <laughs> you lose control of it. Yeah. And so it's not something that I kind of seek out, but I also recognize that there's a, you know, uh, there's a Native American artist named N. Scott Mamade who uh, writes about um, Native American, uh, like Kiwa, uh, uh, origin stories and, and things like that but he's also a writer and uh, one of his books I think it was um, I think it was Housemate of Dawn but it, uh, he talks about um, sort of in Christian traditions you know the beginning was the word and he was sort of expressing that, that there's something similar in some Native American traditions. Um, but what's captured in the word is that the, the stories that people tell, whatever they are, right? Every time you tell a story, you leave a part of yourself there. So it's like, you know, it's like leaving your atoms at the bottom of a tree. You know, the story that you tell is an atom for somebody else to take and to carry on and it has an influence on them and it affects them as a person and those ripple effects you know you, you can't even trace them i mean it, you know sometimes they're very immediate and you know exactly what they are but sometimes they're really subtle and th they continue through generations of people just because you, you know it may be from a conversation that we had i'll learn something from you that i'll tell my kids about and maybe it gets morphed over time, but there's still that sort of element there that keeps running through that, and we learn from each other. Yeah, you know, that's what, so. I just that's blowing my mind. By the way, <laughs> Cora just said this recently, and I'm just gonna because I never thought about this. She's like, imagine there's no there's as many versions of you as people you've told stories to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I was like, yeah. Oh man, she's like, yeah, no two people know the same Cora. Yeah. So I, I've been getting like, yeah. did you watch a recent uh, Joe? He had this guy that came up with uh, the simulation theory on. Yeah, I know about talk about things. Nick uh, Bostrom or yeah. or Nordstrom or something like that. Yeah, talk about mind blowing. Yeah, I didn't see that one specifically, but I know what you're talking about. It's uh, there's a lot of sort of simulation theory and uh, string theory, like. Yeah. levels of consciousness so to speak yeah. i mean it's in a lot of science fiction i read a lot of science fiction so it's uh well somebody was telling me they're like as soon as we can teleport everything from the original star trek will be true 
And I was like, damn, yeah. you're right, man. Yeah. Well, and this idea that we might be, you know, we might be simulations ourselves is kind of a mind blowing sort of thing. But if you think about it in just terms of, you know, basic structures of your mind, you know, and that we're all these sort of collections of neurons. And it's what's sort of remarkable is that enough of our patterns in our brains, as complex as those are, and as much chemistry and electricity that's going on in there, that we still have similar enough patterns to recognize each other as the same or as similar or as, you know, fellow beings or, you know, people that we can love and trust and all that kind of stuff. You know, that to me, that's mind blowing. I mean, we're, you know, when I was talking about sort of things that are powerful and metaphysical and, you know, uh, that uh, sort of go beyond explanation, it's those kinds of things for me. And they're mostly drawn from science that are enough evidence of something remarkable going on <laughs> that I'm good with that <laughs> i don't need you know i don't need uh i don't need a guy with a, a long beard and, and a coat and i don't need a guy with uh hooves and a tail to you know have my mind blown by you know what we're experiencing <laughs> yeah totally yeah. um i was gonna ask you about this because i've been just recently exposed this last night and now um i'm down a rabbit hole on it but have you seen that netflix show the family i have not oh man <laughs> it's really okay. heating up in episode four they just brought donald trump in but uh, so it starts off telling about this like religious organization yeah like uh it's very much so you almost start to get the feeling a little cultish but but not really, you yeah. know, it's, just, it's evangelical, yeah. but then, um, you start to see the, the origins. They start going into it about like the national prayer breakfast. Oh, right. Yeah. I've heard about this. Yes. And we started with Dwight D. Eisenhower and, yeah, yeah. and the organization that was originally behind it and what it became and what it is today. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about this. It's a guy named Doug Coe yeah. and he is in a picture with every president since Eisenhower. Yeah. In, including, uh, I don't know if he's pictured with Trump, but they met with Trump when he was president elect. Yeah. And he died, that Stud Co guy died in 2017. Yeah. And a lot of it's about sort of the lobby that, that kind of goes along with that. Internationally, and, even. Yeah. Right. Right. And it, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, there's, you know, there's a lot to that. I think, you know, part of what we do is um, so many of the stories that we tell these days, right? Um, they look for motive. We're looking for explanations for what's going on in our lives and, and why people do some of the wacky shit that they do, you know? <laughs> And some of the weird ideas that get bounced around and we accept as, as truths and colonial America. Yeah. Well, there's just a ton of them, right? I mean, there, there's a bunch of them and it's, uh, you know, I think as Americans, we, like we were talking about before, we we're constantly looking for meaning and we're, we're, we're desperate for stories that tell us, you know, how this is coming together. And I think something that's probably closer to the truth is that we have, there are collections of interests that work together that either counter our perception of something, right? Or reinforce our perception of something. And we have so many more vehicles now to identify those interest groups and we sort of lump them together as this one thing when they're really not you know they probably don't have as much of a conscious of their own a conscience of their own as we attribute to them but we make sense of the world by 
drawing these disparate things in, they seem to make sense together, right? And so we'll call them this thing, right? Or we'll, we'll group it together and give it this story. And um, it's, and I know you're fascinated with this kind of stuff because we talk about it all the time, but there's, there's both truth and kind of partial truth in that, right? It is true that we can explain sort of these things coming together and these anomalies, and some of them are very intentional. Some aren't. They might be powerful. They might not be powerful. Right? I, I mean, I got to finish watching. I didn't get the. I mean, I'm four episodes in, and I can honestly, I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. But the whole shtick of this organization is that they're covert in the way, in in the regard that and it may take a total turn it may turn to Scientology or something like the, the yeah. campaign against Scientology or something like but it's just like the guy that ran it was like no man I'm just I'm yeah. just doing this work and I don't want any credit you take me off Google well and, and, and here's the thing I think that there are people out there that are you know intentionally Pressing an agenda and have compatriots that press an agenda that's like that religiously. Um, and I think they have some influence. But the idea that it is, um, that it's sort of self conscious and that it has the power to change things because when we get into these stories that's what we're always told is that okay there's this direct cause and effect these people have pushed this thing we've had these kinds of influences so therefore this thing affected this thing it may be true to some degree but it's also not true to some degree you know people aren't like people aren't really brainwashed (laughs) <laughs> you know they get influences but they're still independent beings that make decisions about things and and sometimes they 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 justify the things that they do based on some other influence that somebody has but that just gives them you know that gives them a, a place to displace blame right if things go wrong or seem a little bit wacky right uh so it's it's uh i like those kinds of things you know, I, I love those kinds of shows. It kind of reminds me of Making a Murder, yeah. if you watch that. It's but, just that kind of style. But of they always it. feel a little bit overplayed. Like, uh, the, you know, it's too... Um, oh, they have, like, legit actors in this. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of documentary style, but, I mean, I'm talking like uh, yeah. fame, like the guy for the, played the president in Some of All Fears. I can't remember what his name is. He yeah. looked like my junior high principal. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a kind of... Uh, and maybe it's it's being a historian. There's a certain dishonesty in some of those things that you know I, I appreciate them. I think they're interesting. They they pose some interesting questions, but they're also fundamentally dishonest. I make uh, you know I make all my students um, write a two page paper about any film that has passed itself off as historical. Yeah. And talk about yeah where it falls short. It's critical response. Well, and even. Even our best films, even the things that, that, the, you know, just like we were talking about with the story, there's a piece of the story that always continues and, and sort of ripples through things. Um, but no story captures complete truth. No story. And, and so, you know, there's, and a lot of stories because of how they're motivated are more dishonest than others and so i know that's the biases against the enemy or whatever it is yeah and so when i ask students to deal with uh like sources for senior seminar papers and things like that you know the 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 two big places that i say you need to be worried most about is um who's paying Right? Is there money? Is that me ringing? <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you need to get that, go ahead. <laughs> I, no, no, I don't no. know if I even have my phone in here. I left it. <laughs> uh, but if if somebody has you know a financial interest, right? 
and anybody who makes a movie does, right? And so they're going to give you a story that's more sensational because it's going to draw more eyes and things like that, right? Well, I mean, could could uh, and the other is ideology. So the other is like if you if you have a political agenda or something like that, and you want people to see the world in a certain way, then yeah, I mean, your 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 story is going to reflect that. I've thought about this several times. You're actually the person that told me about the NSA, if I'm not mistaken. Probably. But, I, you know, in that grad school, I took first and second grad school as a class to just dealing with that. And, I mean, I wonder if some of this stuff we won't look back and say, well, that was a part of that third Red Scare type event. On oh, yeah. this this organization yeah, that yeah. infiltrated Hollywood, yeah. you know, like I yeah. I joke around about it, but Casino in Russellville, yeah. Ozark the television show season two is <laughs> all about a casino coming to place people yeah. don't want it, yeah, and, and it's in our region. Oh yeah, yeah, and it, you know, it's very hard for you to realize your own story while you're living it, you know. Uh, Context, perspective. Yeah, I mean, if you ask those people during the Red Scare, they don't know what the Red Scare is. I mean, that's not a term that they use. It's kind of, you know, if they do, it's kind of a... a well, it false flags, right? I mean, yeah, anything that's happened, it's like, did we know it was, I mean, can you think, like, I mean, when Bay of Pigs was happening? Yeah. What was, uh, did, what was the, so what was the perception at that time in the media like what was that being billed as um well it <laughs> or a golf a tonka yeah. how much after the fact did the consciousness change their mind about that it it, it, it changes a lot um both the golf a tonka and, and the bay of pigs though were pretty immediate because those were um uh People started questioning those and the motives from the beginning. Okay. Um, and you know, with something like the Bay of Pigs, it was actually. Uh, um, I can see that being more immediate for sure. Y- y- yeah, you can't because of what's, I, cause of what's I, going on. And it was actually part of the discussion, you know, because Kennedy didn't want it, didn't want the Americans to be linked to it, and just the assumption that they could have kept something like that quiet on an invasion (laughs) you know where you you know assuming that because what happened is there's there was an american pilot that was flying uh a cover for the ground troops on the beach that was shot down and so everybody knew the americans were involved at that point and and to assume that people won't find that out i mean and that's just one of a million different links that you could go to Right, and you know maybe if the thing is successful, uh, maybe you can control communication a little bit more. But definitely, when you fail, no, all that stuff's out, right? <laughs> I mean, and Castro and those guys are saying, you know, the Americans are behind this from the from the very beginning, and some people knew that, you know. But that's a communist plot. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, and you're right. I mean, the, the, uh, so, dude, was there that going on, too? Oh, I mean, on sure. both sides. Like, and then it's like, well, what's the, what's the public going to believe? For sure. But the, the administration also, they, uh, they had to come clean, you know. At some point, you got to tell the truth because the consequences, if you don't, if that sort of, if people don't know what exactly is going on in that, the consequences in the instance like that are is nuclear war. Uh, so you know, <laughs> the truth sometimes wins out because it it has to because people will destroy themselves if it, if it doesn't. Uh, but then there's a whole lot of instances where you know, you, yeah, things are, are kept under wraps and you learn about the story much later. Um, and usually it's not it's not the story itself. There's very few things that we don't sort of have an inkling of while they're happening or right after they're happening. Uh, the fuller truth uh, can become clear over time. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, it'll just never be clear. That's what always has fascinated me about, and I, I brought this, I was talking with a student about this, that family show today, and I'm like, well, here's the thing. 
this is in this era that we are still reevaluating and reinterpreting and finding new things out. Like the 45 to present era, like, or the, the U.S. History 2 era. Yeah, it gets more and more tenuous the closer to the present you get, yeah. Yeah, and well, and I, I, it's, it is fascinating about it, and I, I love changing interpretations and, and revision of that stuff. Yeah. Like that's, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Right? I wonder how much is going to change in my lifetime about well, the stuff that I learned f when I was in undergrad or in grad school, for example. Well, dig this as a theory. <laughs> um, so uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, I went to this thing called the Contemporary History Institute. And so we, we studied what's supposed to be contemporary history. And the idea of contemporary history is something more recent. But at the time, it was the Cold War. The Cold War was just coming to an end. And so that was our last sort of story that we were telling. And so what did that mean? You know, that we were sort of at the last stages of this, participants in it, but still having to tell that story. And, and what does that do to you as a historian? And, uh, you know, one of the common assumption was that <clears throat> if it's less than 30 years old, it's not really history. And I think part of that assumption was based on a kind of generational thing, because we, we mark generations by 30-year increments, typically, because people have babies around the time they're 30. <laughs> and so uh, there's something about, you know, that is removed from your current sort of lifetime of a generation. What if nowadays, because of the pace of communication and because of how much we know and how much that we can put out more quickly than we ever could before, that that gap for what could be legitimate history has been shortened significantly. And so maybe we're in an era where something that is we can say something more truthful about something that's 10 years old than we ever could before just because of the amount of information and different perspectives that are out there on a certain thing whereas before it had to be 30 years because you had to have all of this time to bring all that stuff together but now we got it at our fingertips and it's flying at us at the speed of an electron you know um, so contemporary history might be more of a thing now, right? Where you can do something more in recent history that has more lasting power to it. That, that you can get the truth out. The other thing that gets in the way, of course, is declassification processes, but that's only for certain categories of things. Well, I th I've been thinking about this too, like momentous events in history. If you get, okay, like you got Industrial Revolution, Printing Press, the Internet. And it's like, how can we even interpret the Internet yet? Oh, That's what I've been thinking about. It's like, what, things like, I remember the first time somebody was like, uh, started talking about cyber law with me in like 2010 or something. I never really thought about it. But uh, I, I, I gave this example to my students the other day. I was, I was talking to them about the Stamp Act. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, no, we don't care about the Stamp Act. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm just like, yeah, but what if you had to pay every time that you had to send an email? Yeah, right. Or what if you had to pay yeah. for every single text? And I was like, I remember when I had to pay for every single text, by the way. Yeah. But I, I was like, you guys know how much you text. And that's why they changed it to pay for, like, where you just get an unlimited text plan that's economical and everybody can afford it. Yeah. But I'm like, imagine some of these taxes being placed, like, like, uh, like digital taxes. Yeah. I mean, do you think that would be a thing? Like, digital tax? Um, we're, we're paying for, I don't do, like, put the DVD in. <laughs> so last 10 years ago or whatever I don't know but it, what I do know is that um, it probably won't be direct I think it'll be indirect and so um, in some ways we are already taxed all the time uh, but it's not in um, it's not in money it's in information and so every time that we put something on Facebook 
it contributes to a database and a personal profile that is then sold to somebody else. So the things that we think and that we like are commodities. And so if you think of that as taxation, we're constantly being taxed without being represented. Um, and and that's, that's a scary thing. Thing and and to me that's the parallel to something like the Stamp Act. Yeah, here's uh, here's something. This this the last podcast I did on Monday with uh, Josh Wilson, no relation. Uh, we, he just fin he just finished his first book. Hmm. Right, it's a fiction book, but uh, he's he's had some published articles and stuff. He's been on the podcast for I've known him like my whole life, and we're talking like writing strategies and being an author and yeah. yada yada, you know, just like telling these processes. And we talked about it for maybe thirty, forty minutes or something, and he left. And then I got a text on my phone, which I had in here with me at the time, and it was like Brian author strategies yeah, right. <laughs> hit this link <laughs> right. we you got start, him here you start getting those ads and stuff like that it was it, but what's that. crazy is like what you said like yeah. my phone had an app open that right. heard us talking about that then sold that data to somebody yeah. who then texted me yeah so it's you, you are monetized you know you have your information is if it has value which it obviously does to people somebody else has made money off of you without your consent that's yeah and so it, it's it's probably the fundamental issue that we have with privacy laws and the internet and the, the kind of wild west sort of thing out there what i would anticipate in the future is actually more regulation of that um, because i think people will come to the realization that they are uh, you know <laughs> that their ideas and their values are actually the real commodity it's th that's the real value money is only a representation of a thing that has value so what we're we're in a bartering system online it's closer to a bartering bartering system than to a monetized thing it's it's the whole idea behind this blockchain kind of thing you know where people are passing money from place to place through these vast networks of stuff and it's not really money that's going it's you know it's bits of information and it, it, it's <laughs> you know and that that's the real sort of commodity and what we haven't gotten is to a place where we can we know how to articulate that and therefore we know how to regulate that because it, it, it yeah. really is it, it's you know it, it, it's akin to you know we need another kind of natural rights philosophy that applies to our newer sense of of communication and, and that you know where information is valued in a, such a different way than it was you know uh, 400 years ago when we were you know figuring out how to create our political and economic systems yeah <laughs> man I was I was just uh, we're, I just finished Constitution and I'm just like talking about like well the articles isn't really working out like we wanted guys <laughs> Like, we were fighting a war when we broke this. Yeah. Like, we were really overextended at the time. We need something better. Yeah. You know, I mean, but it's just like, imagine, like, I was imagining, I was like, imagine being a year into the revolution. Oh. And you're like, we, and can't, we can't outfit our army. We can't do anything. Well, and the, and the realization that, oh, my God, we just screwed that up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the first republic on earth, and we did our first try. We screwed that thing up. <laughs> now we got to redo it. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, and I mean, yeah, I, I, I get why it's like being you're at war with the, the greatest empire on earth. Oh yeah, and, and there, you know, there's all these issues with uh, taxation and division. Like, I never understood how much of a loyalist sentiment and how much of a. Meh, sentiment there was in the colonies yeah well and, and think about that sentiment in an age of internet trolls 
I shared I shared a conspiracy video today. It was an Avril Lavigne death conspiracy. <laughs> so a new video came out. It's very good. I was trolling though. I was like, I, I do it as a joke now. But yeah. how many people are just joking out there? Yeah, but it, you know, you can go from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution because the only people who know about the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution are the small group of white guys who have all the power who you know happen to be involved in politics and things like that the most educated yeah. the wealthiest your general public you know knowing about the articles of confederation they're probably learning about it as they're already changing you know they didn't last that long <laughs> yeah what was it, like the, 11 years i think uh, uh well it was no 77 to 80 77 to 89 technically um but they were changing the articles um from much what? earlier than that it was like 83 something like that yes yes so yes, yes. i think six years yeah and one of the articles was yeah, there was a big f fight to get it ratified was there not for a couple of years yeah, for sure. Right. So there's like eighty one or something. Right, right. And and most people aren't paying attention to that. You know, they, they just know, okay, they're no longer British and now they're, <laughs> they're something else and they're not worried about all those political institutions. But now everybody's informed. Right? Everybody's informed immediately about stuff. So you get trolls going after the Articles of Confederation. They start to question the intelligence of the founding fathers and they undermine the thing before it even gets a chance to you know make corrections and maybe it devolves into civil war right away British come back in kick our butts and we're back to being British citizens again well you know I mean I didn't didn't realize this as much as that there was a I mean I did but I never thought about it. some people literally thought the constitution was a counter revolution yeah, yeah, I've seen it interpreted that way before. And I, I'd never really worked with that interpretation until somewhat recently. I've just been in American Revolution. This yeah, I, I've always, seen all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I've always termed it as a conservative revolution. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it's you know because when I think of counter revolution, I, I think of like the French Revolution examples where it gets you know it's really it's radical and it, yeah and yeah. it goes really far back and forth. But I, you know, I, I've always thought the American Revolution is in a kind of tighter box. Um, but it's it's conservative in some ways, particularly from the Articles to the Constitution, because uh, we're putting back in more executive power, essentially, and the power to tax, which are two things that were fundamental to the Revolution that we were fighting against. But then we realize that. If we're completely Wild West and anarchic about things like taxation and things like, you know, just an executive branch that can enforce laws, then we have no power at all. We don't have the power to maintain an army. We don't have the power to regulate interstate commerce. We don't even have the power to defend our Constitution or our articles, whatever they are. And so there's a realization that there's a certain amount of power that you have to maintain. So you put back in an executive branch, you put back in the power to tax, which were equated with tyranny by a lot of the revolutionaries. But you're able to do that because you're coming from a system that, that balances power between the executive and the, and, and the legislative branch and that the, you provide checks and balances to do that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, you know, if we're talking about, like, the Internet and stuff, so you put the Internet in that time period, um, it, it, it makes you wonder if you can have a conservative revolution in that way because you know people are going to be at each other so fast that it can fly apart much more quickly and that may be the kind of thing that we're dealing with now i wonder like i wonder if the the french i wonder if their revolution went down that much more radical track 
looking at ours as I mean I, that would be one of those instances. I mean, I would think so, man. I mean, it, I, never yeah. thought, I never thought about that way. Yeah, I would. I would think so. Because they were kind of learning from oh, oh your articles isn't working out so much, or you know, because I mean the the Declaration of the Rights of Man was definitely influenced. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, it was also different because ours was in a colony. I mean, there was actually in the the friggin' empire. I mean, it was in the mother country, yeah. right? So their consequences were much greater than ours, right? We could be this experiment halfway around the world because uh, nobody cared, right? Um, but if you'd had, you know, if we we're kind of a reflection of an English civil war in some ways or an offshoot of that. Uh, and so England had kind of dealt with all of these issues <laughs> internally and the colonies were just kind of another expression of that and I think they'd, they'd gained some perspective on that um, the French didn't have that kind of tradition you know yeah. it, 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 uh, so theirs was much more abrupt and it was much more serious theirs is, more, theirs is closer to a civil war you know we call these things revolutions and we think that you know that would make the American Revolution more like the French Revolution honestly no Right. Man, I'm so fa- I love the French Revolution. I'm so fa- I took that class with oh, Krieger and Napoleon. I talk about it all the time. It's fascinating stuff. It really is. The French Revolution, in some ways, more interesting than the, the American Revolution, just because it's got you know, it was just a wilder ride. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll say I'm kind of obsessed with um, this go around uh, French and Indian War to constitution yeah and it is making like i was sitting here thinking yeah. thoughts i haven't thought before is the word uh, in our conversation yeah yeah but uh, it's been that way because i've been interpreting the the french connection and all the all them sending us uh yeah the international perspective is fascinating i mean and, and doing it you know because we do these we always teach these things in isolation right it's very american centric kind of thing yeah but if you do sort of the international approach to it it puts it in a really different context, and it's it's always been interesting. Teaching the teaching the Cold War and Civ Two is like that. Yeah, like I I mean I talk about the United States obviously, but it's it's I, I had to step back. Cause I've taught Civ Two more than anything now, and I I had to step back and say like, and I'm going to tell this not from the U.S. history point of view. Yeah, exactly. It's a different thing in international perspective. It, you, do you still teach American uh, uh, or uh, you what do you taught American diplomatic history and yeah, one other? I will. You know, I haven't taught in in. What are you teaching right now? So I'm teaching 1903. Okay. So I just got done with revolutionary stuff. So it's okay. on my mind too. All right. Hey. So I'm on pace. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And then uh, I'm teaching senior seminar. Okay. Uh, but next semester I'll teach the spies class and uh, graduate seminar in U.S. history. Uh, but I'll get back to all of those yeah. things over the next couple of years. So. Yeah, yeah. That that espionage class. It's so much fun. Man. <laughs> if you ever wonder why I'm into conspiracies. <laughs> like, I tell people all the time, I'm like, this class made me believe that just like, I, I don't believe in anything. Yeah. Uh, just, let me tell you a story about this guy. Yeah. Alan Dulles. Or, or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, it's... Um, yeah. Did you talk about King's Eyes and Ears in that class? I don't think so. Okay, so that was, Krieg, according to Krieger notes, the most effective spy system in all of the ancient world employed by the... Um, Byzantine? Uh, Darius the Great, I believe, is who it was. Yeah. So, yeah, he, the king's eyes and ears is ran by the office of the royal secretary yeah. and a board of auditors. Yeah. And this is to spy, an ancient world spy system in the Persian Empire, the first Persian Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Achaemenid Empire or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, those are... <laughs> yeah. Um... You started off with like uh, I do Elizabeth mostly, or something, right? Well, I do mostly Cold War stuff, you know, so I'll, I'll draw references from those early stuff, but I get through that really quickly because, you know, most of my expertise is, of war. is World War II and Cold War. Yeah. We do a little bit of World War II. I remember War. you just were, you, you did we have did, a little beginning yeah, where you're it's like, part of war this stuff. is a yeah. thing, it's been around forever. Oh, it's been around, yeah. Now let's talk about how it's relevant to... Yeah, and I'm no expert in the earlier stuff, but, you know, I, 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 I know the later stuff pretty well. And yeah, it's always <laughs> it's one of those classes where uh, you're always going to learn something surprising. 
because most of that stuff is not common knowledge and it's not talked about a lot and it makes it all seem really um, kind of uh, mysterious and new and you feel like an insider mm-hmm. when you get into it when you start to look into that stuff it, you know th- there's uh, it's everywhere I mean there's tons of <laughs> you know it's 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 pretty common stuff but it's it's just people taking the time to bring it together because you know a spies class is just not something that you know most people teach and I got lucky enough to have a class on spies uh, from a guy at Ohio University when I was a graduate student and I was the I was his TA for the class man I I scored so much stuff from just going to school like, oh yeah, I have all my notes. They're they're oh, literally sitting in a pile next to my desk. I, I just pull them out all the time. I got digital notes from what some of them I typed up and saved. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I found my hops and stuff on my hard drives. Oh good, yeah. I was gonna ask you about that. No, said, we're good, we're good. I was I was wanting to watch the Z guard stuff, but Nick Oots has been man. Hobson's about his size. Yeah, right. Like, he likes a lot of Hobson's games. So yeah. I was trying to. Cora did some Hobson stuff in class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's well. She's who got me back like thinking about stuff asking me questions I was just like yeah. oh, yeah. Um, With that, that leg hook under the arm under the head yeah. <laughs> for the far side arm uh-huh. bar rolling thing yeah I'd forgotten all about that man. yeah it's funny there's a whole segment of that series I forgot too but yeah anyway well, man, I gotta go to awards ceremony. Yeah, I gotta, go, I gotta go too, yeah, man. I know. So, we, I don't even know how long we've been talking. Hey, uh, sure. Two hours, over two hours. Yeah, two hours, kind of minutes. Figure. I really appreciate you taking the time, man. Oh, I loved like, it. It's always fun. I, um, I've always wanted to have you on, so this is. Uh, yeah. I don't get to talk to you enough. I feel I like so then I end up texting you at random times, and yeah. it's good. To, it's good to just sit down and have a conversation. Yeah, man. I agree, so, man. All right, signing off here. All right.